A friend of mine some years ago was uh, conducting some meetings just like we've been conducting here and after the lecture a man came down to the front and he said, excuse me Mr Preacher, he said, I have a question, would you be able to answer it for me? And my friend said that he'd be happy to answer it if he could and uh, the man said, look, um, what do you think is the most popular church in town? Well, my friend thought for a moment and named a certain church that he thought had the largest number of people going to it. And uh, the man said, well, thank you very much. And he was just about to walk away when my friend said, now, listen, just before you go, he said, you've asked me a question. I'd like to ask you a question. And uh, the man said, well, I'm happy you uh, asked your question. And my friend said, why did you ask me that question? Oh, the man said, that's easy. He said, I'm, I've just moved into town here recently and I'm planning to open up a business. And he said, I think it would be good for my business if I belong to the most popular church. Now, there are all sorts of reasons that people have for belonging to a particular church. Some people belong to a church because they were born into it. Now, I guess in most cases, we are what we are because our parents bequeath that to us. Is that right? Generally speaking, that is the way most people are. Other people join a church because it happens to be the closest to where they live. Others join a church, they like the preacher or they like the music. There are all sorts of reasons that people have for joining a particular church. I believe that none of those reasons are very substantial reasons. The only reason that we ought to belong to a church is because we're convinced that that church teaches the truth. And that truth has got to come from the Bible. Well, people say, don't all churches believe in the Bible? Yes, they do, I guess. At least most do, anyway. They believe the Bible. But there's still a tremendous division within Christianity. I would think that in this area alone there would be hundreds of different uh, denominations. So amongst the maze and all the conglomerate that there is today, how do we work out truth? That's our subject tonight. Come over to John 17 and verse 17. And Jesus made this statement. You'll notice it's in red, so the words of Jesus. This is actually the great high priestly prayer of Jesus. And he said in the midst of this uh, prayer, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now obviously the true church would have to be upholding the truth. Couldn't be the true church unless it was upholding the truth, could it? And that truth obviously will be found in the Bible. Now tonight when we discuss the subject of why there's so many churches, the first thing that we need to discuss is which was the first church. Because if we can find out which was the first church, that will give us a major clue as to what God had in mind when he established the churches. Well people say to me, if we're going to talk about the first church, that's got to be the Catholic church. Well I'm surprised at the number of even Protestants who believe that, but that's not true. I'm going to show you the first church existed hundreds and hundreds of years before there was a city of Rome, let alone a church of Rome. So come back to, or over to the book of Acts, the seventh chapter, which is the next book, chapter 7 of Acts and verse 38. And here we read about the first congregation or the first church. And the word congregation or church is exactly the same original Greek word. And verse 38 says, This is he who was in the congregation, or the church, in the wilderness, with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Now what church was that? that what congregation was that? That God established back there at Mount Sinai, that God gave the living oracles to. What church was that? What denomination? What is the name of that church? Yes, the Israelites, the Jewish church, call it what you like, but that's all true. So the very first church that God established was the church of Israel. Right back there in the beginning. And when it says here, he gave them the living oracles to give to us, what's the living oracles that he's referring to there? Yes, the Ten Commandments. 
So you see, God gave the Ten Commandments to the church of Israel, and as it says, they in turn were to give them unto us. Now when it says us here in the book of Acts, who's that? Yes, that's the Christians in the New Testament. So you see, the New Testament knows nothing about the Ten Commandments being done away with at the cross. Because the Bible says that God gave that original church, the first church, the living oracles or the Ten Commandments, they were to keep them, they were to look after them, they were to preserve them, so that in turn they would be able to bequeath them and to give them to us in the New Testament. That was one of their purposes. And you think about it uh, as you cast your mind back over that original church, how God wonderfully loved that church. He gave himself for it. He organized the church. He fed them with manna day after day. He kept them warm by night with a pillar of fire because, you know, it's very cold in the desert, particularly in the, uh, in the winter. And during the day, he protected them from the searing sun by a pillar of cloud. And he wonderfully blessed that church down through the years. But the trouble was with that church that while God gave them the Ten Commandments, notice what they didn't do to it. Have a look at verse 53. Verse 53 it says, Who have received the law by the direction of angels and have what? Not kept it. Now that was the tragedy with the church of Israel. So you see, God established or gave the Ten Commandments to the church of Israel. And you can see that there on our diagram. That was one of the foundations of that original church, that first church, were the commandments of God. But the tra tragedy is they didn't keep it. But God gave that church something else. Come over to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and notice here verse 1. Maybe we uh, just cast our eye over the uh, context here in 1 Corinthians 10. It's talking about the children of Israel, this church that we've been referring to. It talks about how they all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food. Now notice verse 4. And all drank that same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So who was the rock that that original church was established on? It was Jesus Christ. No question about that. Jesus is the rock upon which the church was built. So not only did God establish the original church with the Ten Commandments, but the rock, that is the foundation of that church, was none other than Jesus himself. He was the rock. And so that original church had two great themes. Themes that run all through the Bible. The rock, Christ Jesus, and the commandments of God. The faith of Jesus and the commandments of God. And how, uh, how God blessed that church. But the trouble was with that church that God established. They not only didn't keep the Ten Commandments, when Jesus came along, what did they do to him? They crucified him. So that church that was once the custodian of the truth of God was established by God as the original first church that he blessed and cared for the apple of his eye, finally goes into apostasy because they reject the commandments and they rejected Jesus. And that's the pattern. Because when people reject the commandments, the next step is they reject Jesus. And that's the sad history of the experience of the church of Israel. And so when Jesus came along, he established another church. Remember, Tonight we're talking about why there are so many churches. So far we've got one church that now falls away into apostasy. So when Jesus came onto the earth, he established a second church. What was that church called? Yeah, the Christian church. Now the Christian church was established on exactly the same platform as the church of Israel. Because you see, truth never changes. 
As the Bible says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Never changes. And so we can expect that when Jesus established the Christian church, it was built on the same foundation as the original church. Now, nobody doubts that the Christian church was founded upon Jesus. I don't think I'd have to convince anybody about that. But sometimes there are some Christians who doubt whether the commandments of God were part of the Christian church, but they were. Let me read it to you. Come back to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew, the 15th chapter. And we'll notice here verse uh, 1 and 2. The religious leaders, you see, came to Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees. And they challenged Jesus as they often did over religious matters. And here in verse 2, they asked Jesus a question. Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, as we mentioned the other night, this washing of the hands had nothing whatever to do with hygiene. We're not talking about a hygiene rule here, but they used to rub their hands together with water between and everything they touched then, they said, was ceremonially clean. Now, when Jesus came along, he didn't rub his hands together, nor did the disciples, and so they were immediately in conflict with the religious leaders who said to them, why aren't you following the traditions of the church, the traditions that have been going on for hundreds of years, the traditions that mother and father taught us and their parents taught them and their parents taught them, those traditions that have been going on for years, why don't your disciples and you yourself follow those things? It's interesting what Jesus said in reply, verse 3. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Can you see how the devil had deceived these uh, people? That the more earnest they were in following what the church said, that is following the traditions that the church taught, in actual fact, what were they doing to the commandments? Breaking them. So... The more they adhered to what the church said, the more they were breaking one of God's Ten Commandments. And in this case, it was commandment number five. Can you see how the devil had got them? And uh, finally, Jesus summed it up in verse nine when he said, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And I don't care what church it's in, any church that teaches human teachings that cause the members of that church to break any one of God's Ten Commandments, that church is vain or useless. I don't care what denomination it is. I don't care how earnest and sincere the members and the leaders of the churches are. If they are teaching their members to break any one of God's Ten Commandments, Jesus condemns it by saying, that church, that teaching is vain or useless. Because that was the issue back in Jesus' day. And I want to say this, that the issue that we're facing in the Christian church today is exactly the same as the issue 2,000 years ago. Human nature doesn't change much over the years. Hardly changes one iota. And Jesus met the issue of the commandments versus tradition head on. And we need to do the same today because it's exactly the same problem. You know, everywhere I go, I find people tell me that the Christian church was established upon the rock St. Peter. Ever heard that? Yes. Upon this rock, I'll build my church, they say. You know, that's the only text some of them know. Upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Well, listen, friends, Jesus wasn't saying that Peter was the rock. They misunderstand what Jesus was saying there and they misunderstand the the play on words that uh, Jesus is involved with. Because you see, in the original language, Peter's name means a little pebble. It comes from the Greek word petros. That's where we get our English word Peter from. And uh, the Greek language, like many languages, the ending of the word affects the meaning of the word. You have a base part of the word and then you put the ending. It might be nominative, objective, ablative or uh, accusative and so forth. Feminine, masculine. And that changes the meaning of the word. And that's exactly what happened here. Jesus was saying, thou art Petros. Masculine, which means a little pebble. You're a little pebble, Jesus is saying. 
but he said, upon this Petra I will build my church. He was talking about himself. Because Petra, that's the feminine ending of the word, means a huge rock, like the rock of Gibraltar. That would be a Petra, not a Petros. And Jesus was simply saying to Peter, thou art Petros, but upon this Petra I will build my church. I mean, if Jesus was saying to Peter that he was building the church upon Peter, he would have said, Thou art Peter, and upon you I will build the church. But he didn't say that at all. It was himself. How strange it would be that in the Old Testament we find that Jesus is the rock, but when we get over to the New Testament we find that St. Peter is the rock. Doesn't make sense. And I don't want to belong to a church that's built upon a mere man, no matter how good the man was. I want to belong to a church that has its foundations in Jesus. And I'm sure you do too. And whether it's Old or New Testament, Jesus is the rock upon which the church is built. And thank God for that. And so we are talking uh, tonight about why are there so many different churches. And so far now, we've got two churches. We've got the original church of Israel. Now we have the second church, the Christian church. You know, I meet people who come along to me and they say, Jeff, the trouble, look, I could never leave the church that mother and father brought me up in to join a new denomination. You know, I've had, I have people say that to me from time to time. I like to remind them that every person that joined the Christian church left the denomination that mother and father brought them up in. Is that true? You think about it. What church was the Blessed Virgin Mary brought up in? It wasn't, the, uh, it wasn't the, uh, the Christian church, was it? What church was she brought up in? The Jewish church. St. Paul, St. Peter. Every one of the apostles were all brought up in the Jewish church. And when Jesus came along with added light and further truth, in order for them to stay in the truth, they had to leave the denomination that mother and father brought them up in, the traditions that they had known for all their lives. They had to leave that church and join the new church that Jesus was establishing called the Christian church. Isn't that true? Everyone. So there's nothing wrong with changing your denomination as long as you are changing with truth. In fact, God expects us to change our denomination when that denomination that we may have been brought up in no longer teaches the full truth. God expects us, just like he expected those Jews to join the Christian church. You know, there's a song that uh, most of us know, Give Me That Old Time Religion. It was good enough for father and good enough for mother and it's good enough for me. I want to tell you there's not too much truth in that at all. Because what was good enough for father and mother is not necessarily what's good enough for us today. We don't believe that in any other area. We don't believe that in, uh, in driving a horse to the meeting tonight, did we? Nobody came in a horse, on back of a horse. Now, our parents, our grandparents and so forth, they did. We have refrigerators. Our grandparents and so forth, our relatives, they didn't have a, a refrigerator. We have a computer in our home. They didn't. We have a motor car and so forth. We don't believe what was good enough for father and mother in any other area was good enough for us. And yet when it comes to religion, many people want to stay back in the horse and buggy days and not realize that as we get closer to the coming of Jesus, truth is going to become more and more clear and evident. And God has special truth for these last days. Now, I wish that I could say to you tonight that uh, now the Christian church was established, everybody lived happily ever after. But I wouldn't be telling you the truth if I led you to believe that because unfortunately something tragic was going to happen in the Christian church. Just come over to the book of Acts now and we'll notice in Acts chapter 20, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20 verse 28. And Paul here is talking to the leaders of the church at Ephesus and he says this, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. 
So Paul was saying that the apostles would hardly be cold in the grave when these savage wolves were going to arise and where were they going to arise? Outside or inside the church? Inside the church. And let me remind you that the greatest attacks that have ever been made against Christianity and the church have always been made from within the church, not so much from without. We have infinitely more to fear from within than we do from without. That's been the history of the Christian church. And Paul here was warning the leaders at Ephesus. He said, look out for those savage wolves who are going to draw away disciples after themselves. So we can expect on the basis of that verse that error was going to creep into the Christian church very, very early. Is that right? That's what Paul was saying. And so we're not surprised when we get over to 2 Thessalonians, a little further toward the back of the Old Testament, that Paul now explains what this apostasy was going to look like and how this apostasy was going to get into the church and what the teachings of this apostasy were going to uh, deal with. Have a look at this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let me just pause there for a moment. What Paul was saying that there were unscrupulous members in the Thessalonian church who were teaching that Jesus was going to come back in the first century and to give their teaching credence, what they were doing is that they were sending out letters to all the members of the church teaching this error that Christ was going to come back in the first century and in order to give their teaching credence, they actually forged Paul's signature on the bottom of the letter. What, what lengths people will go to to deceive people. And Paul said, even if you get a letter as from us, as though the day of Christ has come, don't believe it. Why not? Verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. That's the coming of Jesus. Will not come unless or until the falling away comes first and that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So the Bible is now saying that this falling away was going to come in the Christian church. Now, it's interesting, in the Greek language, the word that's translated here, falling away, is the word apostatos. What English word do we get from apostatos? Apostasy. In other words, there was going to be a huge landslide away from the truth. An apostasy, a falling away from the Christian church, from the truths that Jesus and the apostles gave. Notice verse 4 as it talks about the man who was going to lead out in this apostasy, who opposeth and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So a man was going to come in the Christian church, people were going to worship him and bow down to him, and he was going to claim to be God on earth. Now I want to tell you, friends, when people believe that you're God on earth, do you think you, they, that that person would have power over an individual? Absolutely. And the church had unprecedented power because at the head of this church was going to be a man that people worshipped and he was going to claim to be God, God's representative on this earth. And Paul goes on to say in verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? In other words, he's giving them a little bit of a reminder. Look, I've been over all of this. Have you so soon forgotten? Then he says in verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So what was going to be the primary teaching of this man of sin? But what error? Error, that's correct. But what error? Lawlessness. Now, look, we all understand when a person is a lawless individual, they have no regard for the law. That was going to be the major teaching of the apostasy that began very early, that they would be opposed to the law of God, lawlessness. And it began very early. Right back in Paul's day, that's when it began. Verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth, 
and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So how long is this lawless teaching going to be allowed to exist into the world? If it began in Paul's day, how long is it going to last through till? Yes, until Jesus comes when Christ destroys him with the brightness of his coming. Obviously then, we are not talking about one individual as the Antichrist. It's a system, a religious Christian system that started in early in the days of the Apostle Paul and continues right through until Jesus comes. In other words, we are experiencing that apostasy in the world right now. Is that true? Rampant. And the teaching is lawlessness. They'll be opposed to the commandments of God. That will be the identifying mark of the apostasy. That's what the Bible says. That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. God forewarned it. And he said, verse 9, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. In other words, they are going to use signs. Satan is going to deceive people into thinking that this is right because miracles are going to be associated with this apostasy. You see, what a, a wonder, when the Bible talks about a wonder, that means something that science does not have any explanation for. But the Bible says it is a lying wonder. That is, it's a deception. Get the thought? It's something that you can't explain. But it's a lie. It's a deception. And the, the devil is going to use that as his trump card into misleading people into thinking that it is the truth because it's associated with so-called miracles. And human beings are very, very impressed with so-called miracles. Very impressed. And the devil knows that. And that's going to be his trump card of deceiving people into disobeying the commandments of God. Verse 10 says, With all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the, the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You see, friends, you and I must love truth if we're going to be saved. You know, I meet people who want to put a lot of emphasis on the Spirit, and I believe in the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, I believe very decidedly in the Holy Spirit. We can never preach too much about the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, we've got to have the other balance, and that is the truth. We row the boat with two oars. One is the Spirit of God and the other is the truth of God. The two things must go together. Because if you row a boat with only one oar, you finish up in a spin. And that's the trouble with many Christians today. They're in a spin. But God wants us to balance it out. And we must love truth. And if you and I don't love truth, then we'll be deceived, let me tell you. We've got to search out from the Bible what is the truth on this particular subject. And when we find that truth, we must hang on to it. And the Bible talks about this man of sin, as you can see there on the, uh, on the diagram. This apostasy was going to be led by a man of sin, the son of perdition. The Bible only uses that expression one other time in the Bible to describe Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition. A man who, who, who stood for Christ on the outside but betrayed him underneath. And so the church here is called the same. It's a Judas. Outwardly, it shows all the trappings of Christianity, but inside it has betrayed the very teachings of Jesus, like Judas did. That's why the Bible refers to it as, as the son of perdition. In other words, as the apostasy took place and this man of sin now is revealed, the church would be about as far away from truth as midnight is from midday. Because God established the church with the Ten Commandments. Now the man of sin, the Bible says, was going to lead the church into lawlessness. The very opposite to how God established the church. And it was during this period that tradition was, uh, became central to the teaching of the church. And one by one, Error started to creep into the church. Then we find images crept into the church. You'll never read about that in the Bible. And by the way, it was when they brought images into the church that led Muhammad to, uh, to establish the Muslim religion because the Muslim religion is very much opposed to having images. 
You look at their mosque, they don't have any images. They have just uh, lines and, and squares and so forth. And it was over this issue of images, and if we hadn't had images in the church, we probably would not have a Muslim in the world today. It's why the Bible says in the book of Daniel that this power is the abomination that maketh desolate. Every conceivable error that's in the world today comes right back to that apostate power that we're talking about. Then uh, not only did they bring images, they brought penance into the church. That's the idea that you've got to do something in order to be able to uh, get right with God. Then after penance, they had confession to a priest because the Bible teaches that we have confession only to Jesus. This power said, no, you've got to go through a human agency, a priest, to find forgiveness. He's got to be a mediator. Then they brought in Sunday into the church. Once again, you'll never read that in the Bible from cover to cover, as we've noticed. Not a single text anywhere in the Bible on Sunday, but this power brought it into the church. This is when they brought baby baptism, and we'll talk about that in our next program. Baby baptism into the church. They brought the immortality of the soul. That is, when you die, you don't die. You go on uh, living in another sphere. And every false religion in the world teaches the immortal soul that you don't die when you die, but you go on living in another sphere. That then brought them to teach eternal torment because you've got to have somewhere for the wicked to go. Then they brought in the idea of Maryology. And today we are seeing the worship of the Virgin Mary take on uh, huge proportions. And any of my dear friends who have been brought up in the church know that in the rosary, there are vastly more prayers said to, uh, to Mary than there are ever to God. Anyone that's been brought up knows with the rosary, there are 10 Hail Marys to one Our Father. 10 times more prayers said to Mary than to God. And she has taken on huge proportions in the thinking of these people. But that's never taught in the Bible. You'll never read that in the Bible anywhere. Mary's hardly mentioned. After the death of Jesus, you don't find her mentioned. Yet she's not, she is important. She's a wonderful woman. But the Bible never elevates her like the church has. And all these things crept into the church and it brings us down to a period in time when there was a young monk who was very dissatisfied with his experience because continually he never found peace in his heart. He tried to find peace, but he couldn't find peace. He went to his superiors and they said, Martin, what you need to do is to have more penance. So what he did is he put stones in his shoes and walked around with those stones. And you know what that would feel like? He would sleep on cold stones rather than to be comfortable at night, believing that the more you made the body uncomfortable, the more righteous you were becoming with God. That's the basis of penance. But the trouble is he never found peace with God that way until one day he went into a monastery and he opened up a copy of the Bible. He had not read the Bible like this before and he opened it up. And you've got to understand that back in those days, most of the Bibles that they had up until that stage, were all written out by hand because printing had only just been invented a few years before by a man by the name of Gutenberg and Caxton in England, William Caxton. And it's interesting that the Bible was the first book that was ever printed. And uh, all the Bibles up until that stage have been written out by hand. Now, you can imagine if the Bible that we have in our hands tonight was written out by hand, can you imagine how much it would cost at today's rate per hour? So nobody would have been able to afford a Bible today either. Or very few would. They couldn't afford it back in those days either. And the only Bibles were a few that were chained in the monasteries. And so he opened this book, Bible up for the first of this book. And his, his eyes lighted on a verse of scripture that he'd never read before. And this is what he read. The just shall live by faith. And suddenly it dawned on his mind, and I believe the Holy Spirit impressed young Martin, that we don't get righteous by what we do, but salvation is something which is given to us as a gift from God. And I tell you, as soon as Martin Luther understood that, the Reformation was underway. And he began to protest. 
Everywhere he went, he protested against what he had been taught and what the church was saying. And as he travelled through Germany, people began to listen to him. And as I said, at this time, the printing press was just beginning to churn out the Bibles. And the Bible was now becoming uh, available in the language, the vernacular of the local people. And for the first time, they began to read the Bible. And when Martin Luther pointed out to them that we aren't saved by what we do, but rather as a gift from God, the Reformation was underway. And people protested everywhere. They protested through Germany. And what church was established in Germany as, as Martin Luther began to go around and the people protested against the church? What church was established in Germany? The Lutheran church. And God wonderfully blessed in the Lutheran church. The Lutheran church was established on the Bible and the Bible only and the just shall live by faith. But I need to read you a verse before we go any further. Come back to the book of Acts, the third chapter. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. And here Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost and he made this statement. Listen, I want to read this to you. It's a very interesting prophecy. Acts 3 and verse 19 where he says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. You see, Peter's preaching here on the day of Pentecost and he says Jesus must stay in heaven. He will not come back to this earth until the times of restitution of all things. Those things that have been spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets down through the years. And so as we think about the second coming, Jesus cannot come back to this earth until the times of restitution takes place. And that's why it brings us down to this time of protest. And Luther, as he began to walk through Germany and, and, and preach, the people protested and they became known as Protestants or Protestants. Unfortunately today, most of the protest has gone from Protestants. And if you take the protest out of Protestants, what have you got left? Ants. And that's about what they're doing back after Rome. That was not God's intention. They were to protest, and they did. The same truth went over into England. And what church was established over in England? The Anglican Church. And I tell you, if you've been brought up in the Anglican Church, you've got nothing uh, to be ashamed of because God established that church. Never believe the lie that the Anglican Church was, about, was um, brought about by Henry VIII. That's a lie. Henry VIII died a Catholic. He was never a Protestant, never. The Anglican Church was begun by men like Hugh Latimer, Ridley and Cranmer. And as they were being burnt at the stake, and today you can go to Oxford and see the little cross in the street opposite Balliol College, little brass cross, where those two men were burnt at the stake. And as the flames were licking up around their feet, Latimer, whose prayers are in the Anglican prayer book, turned to Ridley and he said, Master Ridley, today, by God's grace, we will light a fire in England which will never go out. That's where the Anglican church began, with wonderful men like that. And if you've been brought up in the Anglican church, you have nothing to be uh, ashamed of. The same truth went up into Scotland and the Presbyterian church was established with John Knox. Faith that I was brought up in. And friends, God wonderfully blessed all of those churches. They were established on the Bible and the Bible only and the just shall live by faith. But the trouble is God had more light to bring to the world yet. So this time he raised up another people and they took the name of Baptists. Ever heard of the Baptists? I'm sure you have. Wonderful people. Now the Baptists believe like the Anglicans and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians and the Bible and the Bible only and the just shall live by faith, but they went one step further. What do you think they emphasised that the others didn't emphasise? Bible baptism. And you know what the Anglicans said and the Lutherans said and the Presbyterians said? Our fathers didn't teach that. Get out! And they literally persecuted the Baptists. In fact, the Baptists were so persecuted, particularly in England, that they finally had to leave England and sail over in the Mayflower and they became known as the Pilgrim Fathers who established America. That's how America was established. 
In fact, Pastor Robinson, I was just over in Plymouth just very recently this year. And Pastor Robinson, who was their pastor, preached his farewell sermon to those people on the uh, boat, on the Mayflower. And this is part of his sermon. This is what he said. You'll see it now on the screen. The Lord knoweth whether ye shall ever see my face again. But whether the Lord hath appointed that or not, I charge you before God and his blessed angels to follow men no further than I have followed Christ. If God should reveal anything to you by any other instrument of his, be ye as ready as you ever were to receive any truth by my ministry. For I am confident that the Lord hath more light and truth to break forth out of his holy word. For my part, I cannot sufficiently bewail the condition of the Reformed churches who are come to a period in religion and will go no further than the instruments of their Reformation. The Lutherans cannot be drawn to go any further than that which Luther taught. And the Calvinists, you see, stick fast where they were left by that great man of God who yet saw not all things. This is a misery much to be lamented. For though they were bright and shining lights in their time, yet they penetrated not into the whole counsel of God. But were they now living, would be as willing to embrace further light as that which they first received. Isn't that a wonderful statement? What he's saying is that if Luther was alive today, he wouldn't be a Lutheran. Because light is progressive. And as those men stood for what God revealed at the time in which they lived, they embraced it. But if they were living today, God has more light to bring to the world. And the closer we get to the coming of Jesus, the more understanding we're going to have, particularly of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And truth is progressive. Truth is not something which stands still. And Pastor Robinson said that. He said there is much more light yet to be revealed out of God's holy word. And I want you to be willing to receive that when it comes. Only if people were to follow that good counsel. But even the Baptists, wonderful, wonderful people as they are, still didn't understand everything. And God had to raise up some more people. This time he raised up two boys, two young men in England. They were known as John and Charles Wesley. Ever heard about them? Sure. And the great Methodist revival took place there in England. Some believe that it was the preaching of John Wesley that saved England from a revolution that convulsed France. And it was the hymns of his brother Charles that so stirred the Christian world and we still sing them today. Some of those wonderful hymns there are. You know, John Wesley's father was an itinerant preacher. He would only come home once, once a year. Not surprising that Mrs. Wesley had 19, 20 children. And he came home once a year. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, he did a wonderful work, but Wesley believed like the others in the Bible and the Bible only, and the just shall live by faith, but... He went further and he began to teach methodical Bible study. He taught methodical giving to missions. Everything he did was methodical. That's why they nicknamed him a Methodist. Because that name wasn't a good name, that was a nickname. Don't tell me you want to be a more Methodist, they said. The, the, the opponents of Wesley said. In fact, the Anglican church put out 323 tracts against Wesley in the first six weeks he began to preach. Because truth has always been opposed. And they would say, don't belong to that queer sect of the Methodists. But friends, God had truth with John Wesley. And, God, and, and John Wesley began to preach and he travelled like his father all over and stirred the social soul of England. Outstanding individual was John Wesley. And any of us who have been brought up in the Methodist church have nothing to be ashamed of either. But even the Methodists didn't understand everything and God had yet more light to bring to the world. Can you sense what's happening here? Uh, as you look at the screen and you can see error coming in step by step, can you sense that what God is doing? He's restoring truth step by step. Can you see that? But there's still more error that God had to weed out. This time he raised up people by the name of Adventists. Not Seventh-day Adventists, they were just not of the name Adventists. Because an Adventist is someone who believes in the soon return of Jesus. And if you believe in the soon coming of Jesus, you're an Adventist. 
And this was led by a layman of a Baptist church called William Miller. And William Miller began to study particularly the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And on the basis of those prophecies, he was convinced that Jesus was coming. And thousands and thousands of people everywhere around the world began to accept what Miller was teaching. But do you know what the Anglicans said and the Baptists and the Methodists? When William Miller began to preach these prophecies, they said, our fathers didn't teach that, get out. And they pushed them out of the church. It was never God's intention that we have all these churches. God wanted every, as new truth came to the world, that everybody would embrace it. But the trouble is people drew up a creed around themselves and they said, thus, this is what we believe, nothing more, nothing less. And so instead of accepting that further truth, they withdrew and drew back. But you see, the, the Adventists, wonderful people as they were, never understood everything. They still had Sunday keeping. All of the churches that we've spoken so far all still taught Sunday. And they all believed in the immortality of the soul. God had to weed out those last major errors out of the church. This time he raised up another people and they took the name Seventh-day Adventists. Now, Seventh-day Adventists believed like the Anglicans and the, and the Lutherans and the Presbyterians in the Bible and the Bible only, and the just shall live by faith. They believed like the Baptists in baptism by immersion. They believed like the Methodists in, in the methodical Bible study. They believed like the Adventists in the soon recoming of Jesus and the study of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. But they went one step further. And what do you think they emphasized that the others weren't emphasizing? Yeah, the great teaching of the commandments of God and the simple teachings of Jesus. And do you know what the Anglicans said and still say? Get out. The Baptists say, said then and still say, get out. And the Methodists still say, get out. Because, friends, every church, in, unfortunately, instead of wanting to embrace truth, they want to stand back where their reformers left them and those reformers, wonderful men as they were, never understood all truth for the hour in which they lived. We're not suggesting in any way that they weren't good men, that they weren't spiritual men and that they didn't study their Bibles. They did. But God had special light for the last days. And it's God's intention that that message goes out to everyone. And as soon as we get back, you see, to the same teachings that the original church was established on, it's interesting that a message goes to the whole world. Just come over to Revelation chapter 14, if you wouldn't mind. Revelation chapter 14. And notice the uh, beginning of these three messages. Remember we were studying about the other uh, seminar. Revelation chapter 14. In verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. You see, God has a message now that's to go to all the world. And what is that message? To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. What is that message? How is it summed up in verse 12? Have a look. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Can you see that we are back now to exactly the same platform as the original church was established on, namely the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? Truth has done a complete circle now because we're back in the last days to where God established the church in the first place. And that's why he has a message now going out to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, getting people ready for his return. Now, I want to say this, friends. Seventh-day Adventists don't spend any time patting themselves on the back. Let me make that very clear. Very clear. But Seventh-day Adventists, friends, look back on these other churches with tremendous respect because we believe that God led those churches in rediscovering truth. Get the thought? And what we have today, we have built upon the foundation that they have laid. That's why we are grateful, eternally grateful, for what they did. 
But human nature, being what human nature is, instead of continuing to advance with truth, people have said, well, I'm satisfied with what I've got. Don't tell me anymore. I'm not interested. And that's been the tragedy of the Christian church. And we have so many denominations. Well, people say to me, Jeff, that's not all the churches. You said, where all the churches are coming from? Listen, I have given you the main drift of the churches. Now, there are others out of the... Um, for example, out of the Baptist Church, you have the Church of Christ. You've got many other divisions that believe similarly. Out of the Methodist Church, you have all your Pentecostal churches and, and the myriad of, uh, of divisions within that. Out of your Adventists, you have your Jehovah's Witness, Mormons. You have uh, all sorts of, of ideas that came out of uh, the great Adventist awakening. I'm giving you the major drift of the churches. Now, sometimes people say to me, well, Jeff, how do you know that after the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there's another one? How can you be so certain it's the last? I tell you, friend, how I can be absolutely certain that it's the last. Because Revelation chapter 14, 6 to 12, is a last prophecy. Because as soon as those three messages go to the world, the harvest takes place and Jesus returns. That's why I know it's the last. There is no other. And as I said, we're not spending time patting ourselves on the back, friends. Not at all. Because this is God's last message to the world. And in humility, I believe that God has brought you to these meetings. I believe that God has brought you to be watching today, wherever you are around the world. God has brought you in contact with this truth. That's why we must take it with our grasp, with our hands, and never let it go. Because... This is God's truth for these last days. And listen, if you and I aren't faithful in the accepting of this message, God will lay us aside and he will raise up someone else. Because God doesn't need you and doesn't need me. He can bring, raise up people from the very rocks, he said on one occasion. So he's not dependent upon us, but he's given us an opportunity to hear truth. And when we hear truth, God wants us to accept it and to follow it and then to help our friends to understand it because I want to tell you, friends, this is the most wonderful thing that's going on in the world today. There's nothing more exciting in the world than God's last message being preached to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Someone asked me just before the meeting about other Sabbath-keeping groups. Well, friends, there are, but they're so insignificant, so very, very, very tiny. This is the message that God has raised up. It is the most widespread message in the world. Every nation. There isn't a place under God's heaven that you can go today, but you don't find this message being preached before you get there. I don't care where you go. Because it is God's last message. And if it is God's last message, it has to be everywhere. Isn't that right? Not just in a few places here and there, with one or two people here and there. Not at all. This is God's message. And God is raising up people. That's why, as I said, he's brought you in contact to hear this message. And it becomes a tremendous responsibility of us to accept this message because it is God's last message to the world. This message to us is as important as the message that Noah preached to the people of his day. Because remember Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. It's exactly the same. And we know that those people who never accepted what Noah said were finally lost. And I believe, friends, that the people who do not accept this message will suffer the same fate. Because it is God's final message to the world. I don't say that because I have authority to say it. I don't. But I know from God that this is God's last message. And I read in Revelation chapter 15 where it says, those who are saved in the last days have gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over the number of his name. They're the group that stand victorious on the sea of glass. And the only message in the entire Bible that is telling people about those things are these three messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. A message calling people back to faithfulness to Jesus. 
and faithfulness to his commandments. And just as God established the truth back there in the land in, uh, in Israel, and then uh, the people objected and rejected Christ and rejected the commandments, then Jesus established the Christian church. And unfortunately, many folk went into apostasy in the Christian church. They rejected the commandments moved away from the truth of God and then we find this great error crept into the church and then step by step in the Reformation then God began to restore truth bit by bit, section by section and some of the most wonderful stories are told of men and women who stood for truth. You know, I was over there in France the southern part of France, and I went down to a little place called Constance. It's a little medieval city today. It's one, a wonderful place. If you ever go to France, you must go and have a look at this. It's, it's just the same as it was in the Middle Ages. They've preserved it. People live there still today. You've got the moat, and you've got the walls, and you've got where they used to shoot their bows and arrows out of the slit of the windows, just as it was in the Middle Ages. And I walked up there, I went down to Constance because I wanted to have a look at one particular spot on one of those towers where they chained up a woman by the name of Mary Durant. She spent 38 years there in that cold stone turret. All she had to do was to confess that the, the sins to the priest and they would have let her go. She sat there for 38 years because she believed in the Bible. And she was allowed to knit and she scratched into the stone and you can still see it today. And I photographed it. The French word resiste. She resisted the urge to give in for 38 years. And I tell you friends, what, me, what God requires today in the world are men and women like that that have courage of conviction and will stand for the truth, though the heavens fall. That's what we are needing. And I trust that God will help us to have that conviction and that certainty in our hearts tonight. Let's just bow our heads together in prayer. Our wonderful Father in heaven, I want to thank you again tonight for Jesus, and I want to thank you for the truth that you have shone so brightly in your word. Help us, Lord, today to be like Mary Durant and those in Bible times who stood for truth, though the heavens fall. Grant us much of your blessing now as we go home and bring us back again in our next program, I pray for Christ's sake. Amen.